Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jamie Knight and I'm a graduate assistant at the Allen Alda Center. In case you're less familiar with us, the work we do at the Alda Center is about empowering scientists, medical professionals, and researchers. We help them to communicate their work clearly and vividly to all audiences. I'd like to introduce you to our host, Paul Sutter, who will be presenting A Guide to Speaking with Humans. Here's a few fun facts about Paul. Dr. Sutter is an astrophysicist who studies the earliest moments of the Big Bang, novel methods for detecting the first stars, and the emptiest places in the universe. Host of the popular Ask a Spaceman podcast and YouTube series, Paul regularly appears on radio, TV, and in print, including on the Science Channel, the History Channel, and the Weather Channel. His first book, Your Place in the Universe, was published in November 2018, and his next book, cleverly titled How to Die in Space, is coming out this June. Paul, I'm going to hand it over to you now so we can get started. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who showed up today. I believe this is going to be archived, which is going to be uh, fantastic. Thank you so much to the All in All This Center, uh, the Cavalier Foundation for for hosting this. When it comes to public events, thing to do when you're faced with a giant audience and there's a thousand people silent staring at you or even 10 people silent and staring at you, your first reaction is to do something else, is to not be yourself, is to, is to uh, get nervous or, or, or start rambling or, or go into like a default lecture mode, but try your best to breathe through those moments of tension, to let yourself react, uh, relax and try to be yourself. These people who are coming to your talk want to see you. Yes, they want to see your research. Yes, they want to see your topic, but they want to see you and precisely you present this. So that's who they want up on the stage. They wouldn't have asked you to do that if that wasn't what they wanted. And the second thing is to always seek out opportunities. If you're interested in public speaking, if you're interested in giving live presentations, there are probably more opportunities out there in your community than you know of. So you can reach out to schools, reach out to principals, uh, superintendents, and even teachers and say, I'm a scientist, I have a topic, if you're interested, I can come in and give a lecture to your class, give a talk to your class, do a demo with your class. You can look for public events. Almost every major city nowadays has like a science pub equivalent where a bunch of people gather to get drunk and learn something about someone's research. And that is a great opportunity to talk to those kinds of audiences. There are science fairs, there are science festivals, there are organized activities, there are unorganized activities. They're, they're just in whatever city you live in. Look up, uh, if you want, look up meetup groups. Go to meetup.com and look for uh, science groups or, or humanities groups or academic groups or philosopher groups. And just ask, invite yourself to come talk and nine times out of 10, they would love to have you speak. And one of the most powerful things that I find when I'm giving a talk or when I have a presentation is to be curious myself. I'm always wondering, like I always structured this webinar, I'm always wondering what the audience is curious about. I'm always wondering what they're interested in because I come in with a set of topics, a bunch of slides. I know where I'm going to go, but I always leave room for letting the audience guide the discussion because then it's a two-way street. Then it's a conversation more than just a lecture. And connected to that is, is listening letting the audience speak, whether they're kindergartners or senior centers or somewhere in between, they have interesting thoughts and they have very interesting questions. But, and so when you have the opportunity to give a public talk, don't think of it just as a talk, think of it more as a public conversation, as an event. And 
I always, always, and I think you should do this, always leave time at the end for questions. If, you, if you're given a one hour slot, don't talk for 55 minutes. Talk for like 40 minutes tops. Allow people to ask questions, especially at the end, and then stay after because there's going to be a bunch of people who are too nervous to actually raise their hand and ask a question in front of 100 other people. Let them come up to you. Engage in that conversation. Learn their name. Shake their hands. Like Connect with these people who came all the way out, carved time out of their day to hear what you had to say. Those are my biggest do's. When it comes to the don'ts, I know all of you are skilled by now at giving lectures in symposia or conferences or a colloquium. Okay, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't give the talk that you would give to an academic audience to of the public. You know when you're giving that talk, at a conference or something, and you have one or two slides that set up the big picture, the big problem you're going to solve, and then you drill down into your research. Um, just do those two slides. Just do those two slides. Or expand on those two slides. People want to hear about the background. People want to hear about the, uh, the big picture. And, and don't be afraid to give your research or, or talk about your research, but, but focus on the big picture. And don't pretend that everyone understands. A lot of people are gonna nod their heads going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that makes sense, that makes sense. It's a lie, it's a lie. Give room for the audience to catch up with you. Let them breathe in those moments too. And also some of you might be saying some controversial things. Don't pretend that everyone in the room is going to agree with the things you say. Give room for that disagreement. They may come up to you after, they may ask a question, but that's okay. There's an opportunity here to change minds and convince people, but you have to create that environment for them. And, and lastly, just don't argue, don't, don't be mean. This is an opportunity to engage and connect with the public. So, so just don't be a jerk, okay? And don't sacrifice your research. You don't have to do public events every single day. You can, this isn't, uh, this doesn't have to be a full-time job if you don't want it to be. So allow, give yourself the time that you want to carve out these public events, but, but don't go nuts. Don't go nuts. That's it when it comes to public events. And let's see if there are any questions yet. Thank you for collecting. There's no questions yet. Feel, folks, feel free to pop up some questions uh, in the chat. I don't want to just give this massive lecture, although I can. Don't worry. Once I start talking, I, I don't have to stop. But please, if you have any specific questions about public events, now is the time to ask while I sip some water. But if not, if you feel good, if you feel comfortable about public events or structures of public events. Uh, oh, we are getting some questions in. I will, uh, yes, uh, Mark uh, Hobner is saying avoid jargon. I actually, I, I want to put a little caveat on that. I'm not afraid of jargon in a public talk, but I'm not going to give a jargon word without sharing that with the audience, identifying it as a jargon word, giving them a definition, giving them some examples. Let folks in into the, the secret language of academia. Let them in to that jargon, let them peek behind the curtain a little bit, but you have to do it carefully. So don't load down your talk with jargon at all, but don't be afraid to give them some cool words that they can walk away with. We've got a question here. How do you pitch the talk to avoid patronizing the audience or losing them? This is always a fine line to walk. And it's something you can only do after a lot of practice. And I found, that I can give the exact same talk to you know, a, a theater full of people 
and give the exact same talk to a bunch of kindergartners. The content itself doesn't necessarily matter, but the energy of the presenter does. So if you go in assuming that you're not patronizing these people that you want to share, that you're enthusiastic about it, that is the energy that you're going to have. That is the, what your body language is going to be. That's what your facial expressions are going to be. And that is what you will give the audience. And then it's their choice whether to be patronized or not. So go in assuming that you're enthusiastic about this and you're actually having a really good time. What are some strategies? I'll do this question then before moving on. What are some strategies for dealing with contentious attendees who want to argue with you? Yes, I've encountered this before. I'm an astrophysicist. I've run into creationists. I've run into flat earthers. I've run into UFO conspiracy, the whole deal. When someone asks a question and they turn it into a rant or an argument, I do cut them off. I say, I'm open to questions. There has to be a questions here. It's, uh, you have to do a little bit of classroom management here where you're respecting them, but if it's obvious that they're not respecting you, then you don't have to engage. You don't have to go down that road. If they ask a respectful question, then give them the honest answer. And if they start arguing back, well, then just say, hey, happy to talk to you after the talk, but there's a lot of people here with a lot of questions and we want to get, make sure everyone has their time. Just making sure no one monopolizes your Q&A time. And if they start arguing, well, then there's no question there. They can have their own talk. All right. I don't know about you guys, but I'm having a lot of fun. All right, these are fantastic questions. I'm going to share my screen again. Here we go. Moving on into uh, media interviews. So this is one of the most high stress situations, which is you get an email or a call from a reporter. There's some topic in the news and they want your perspective. Maybe they just want a juicy quote. Maybe they want you to tear something down. Maybe they just, maybe they just need another voice to give perspective or some examples. Sometimes this interview can be with a print reporter. So you'll have an exchange of emails or a phone call. Sometimes it can be with a TV reporter where the reporter is sitting here asking you questions and there's cameras and bright lights right in your face. What do you do? You do, you act natural. What, what you want to be on camera or to uh, appear in quotes in a media is your own voice. You don't want to be someone else. So don't feel like you have to pretend to be someone you're not. You don't have to put on an act. Be exactly who you are. If you're snarky and sarcastic, be snarky and a little bit sarcastic. If you like coming up with goofy metaphors, then come up with goofy metaphors. If you're very serious and focused on you know, p-values and statistics, then, then be serious and focused on statistics. Be exactly who you are. And if you're interested in finding media opportunities, they are out there. Email reporters, email editors, email news desks and say, hey, I'm an academic, I'm a scientist, so-and-so, here are my credentials. I love talking to the public. And if you have any questions, if anything comes down the pipe and you want to do a story on it, reach out to me. I'm, my door is always open. You will be surprised how eager reporters are for content. And you are the content. And don't be afraid to ask questions of the reporter. So if you get that email request, Ask them what their tone of the story is going to be. Ask them what their angle is going to be. Ask them what they hope to get out of this story or what kind of perspectives they are looking for. Don't be afraid to look up this reporter and see their previous work. Do they seem to do a good job? Do they, are they accurate? Do they represent the scientist faithfully? Don't be afraid to do a little bit of digging and don't be afraid to say no. If it's not a fit for the topic, if you don't feel confident on them, if you don't feel like the reporter is going to treat the topic with any amount of integrity, then just walk away. It's better than trying to fight that battle. Uh, be nice. 
<laughs> Reporters are overworked and underpaid to a person across print and media. They make no money and they work all the time. Just be nice to them. If they don't understand something, if they're not getting something, then just be patient. Don't get upset with them. And I, I'm only saying this because I've seen it happen of scientists get mad at reporters for not understanding something. Just be nice. They can be your friend. And if, if you're nice to them, there's better chances they'll, they'll, treat, they'll treat you nicely too. Don't worry so much about where the story is going to go. You can ask those questions to the reporter, but let the reporter ask the questions. Don't try to second guess or build the story for them. Let them ask questions. Let them ask follow-ups. Fill in the blanks when you need to fill in the blanks. Let the reporter lead. They are professionals in crafting these kinds of stories. And so they're searching for the through line. That's not your job. You just need to be honest and give honest answers. And feel free to read the article or watch the clip later. Read the article later. If there is something massively egregious, if you feel like the quote they used doesn't represent you or you didn't mean it or it veers off in a weird direction, read it and contact the reporter and say, hey, I don't think you got this quote right. I don't think I explained myself correctly. Nine times out of 10, as long as it's not print, like Wall Street Journal or something or on TV, They'll, they'll update the article. They'll issue a little correction. It'll be no big deal. This happens all the time. What don't you should do is don't worry about the sound bites. Don't worry about trying to craft that perfectly constructed sentence that, that encapsulates all of the research in some pithy, easy under, to understand way. Don't worry about that. Just talk. Just be yourself. Let the reporter pull the sound bites out. They'll find the juicy stuff. They'll find the good stuff. Let the reporter do that. And once again, just like with public talks, don't pretend that the reporter understands. The reporter may say, uh-huh, yeah, I totally understand. Yep, I get it, I get it, I get it. Feel free to repeat yourself. Feel free to ask the reporter, oh, I, I, I know I used a technical term here. Did you, are you aware of this technical term? open up that space to allow the reporter to say, oh, actually, now that you say I, I didn't quite catch it, could you try it again? Usually reporters are very good at this, but, but sometimes they may not be. Don't worry about how the piece will come out. This is something that is largely outside of your control. So don't Tell the reporter, like, I think you should write it about this. Just, just be honest, answer the questions. The reporter will craft the story. You may or may not like the story that comes out. This is the, the game you have to play. This is what you give up. This is not your story. It is the reporter's story. It is their article. So they're going to craft a story. It may be that you don't like it, how it came out. Well, then you can try to issue a correction. And if that doesn't work... Uh, then just never talk to that reporter again and tell your friends not to work with that reporter. It's just that easy. But take yourself back, just answer the questions with as much honesty and integrity as you can. And uh, this, again, just doesn't have to be a full-time job. Don't sacrifice your research just to answer reporter qu questions. If you're busy, if you're in the middle of grant season, which is apparently 12 months out of the year, and a reporter comes in, Say, I am sorry, I am too busy right now. Here are a couple names of some contacts, some colleagues or some grad students that might have more time to help you. Don't feel compelled to answer every question for a reporter. And you can tell the reporter like, I'm a little bit busy. I've got 15 minutes tomorrow. Is that enough time? It usually is, it usually is. All right, coming back out of screen sharing, so we can look at some of the questions. If any of you have questions about media interviews. Um, oh yeah, great question. We've got an early career researcher at the start of the PhD, not a subject expert or particular experience. I avoid, should you avoid the media or look for different types of opportunities? Here's the thing. If you are at the start of your PhD journey, you are more 
qualified to talk about a topic than 99.99% of the human race. Congratulations, PhD candidate. You are a subject matter expert. You are. Everything you learned in undergrad can apply to a media interview. That said, so I'm telling you, you know everything you need to know to answer a reporter's questions. I, I guarantee it. You're already there. But if a reporter is asking you a question and you honestly don't know the answer, then say, you know what? I don't know. That's it. And the reporter will just move on. Let the reporter lead. So don't avoid these opportunities because you feel like you're not qualified enough because you are qualified enough. And, and even I, I get questions that like, oh gosh, how does that work? I honestly don't know. And the reporter say, okay, moving on. That's it. That's it. Easy breezy. Any other questions when it comes to media interviews before I move on? Uh, when do we grant an exclusive interview rather than holding on to something for a wider audience to use later? 99% of the time, unless you're like a Nobel Prize winner, and maybe you are, uh, unless you're a Nobel Prize winner, exclusive interviews are not going to be a thing. A reporter is trying to write a story, there's some press release, and they're trying to get some perspectives from other people in the community to back it up, to give examples, just to, to liven up the report itself so they get some good quotes. Uh, if a reporter asks for an exclusive interview, then ask them why. Why do you want an exclusive, exclusive interview? Is this related to uh, like drug trials that are coming out? Is this related to some, something that's under embargo? If there's an exclusive interview attached, then there's probably other constructs that are limiting your ability to speak. Going once, going twice, sold on the media interviews we're going to move on we're going to move on don't worry if you if you guys come up with more questions there's plenty of time at the end where i'll go back through for any questions that i missed and so we're going to share the screen once again and we are going to dive into writing articles writing articles so this is the opportunity you might have where you don't have to go through a filter where you don't have to go through anybody else. It's not a reporter story, this time it's your story. Maybe you're writing a story about your research. Maybe you're writing a story about somebody else's research. Maybe something in between, maybe about the state of the field, but you're given some venue and a word limit, here we go. What should you do? You should act natural. Yes, it's gonna be on every single one, okay? You should act natural. When you write, writing is an extension of your personality. Writing is an extension of you. Don't be afraid. Don't worry about extra formal grammar or constructing sentences in that horrible passive aggressive tone that we, we use in journal articles. Like just, just write, put your thoughts on the page. Get the words out, edit it later, or let somebody else edit it later. Just allow your voice to come out. Again, when people are reading this, they don't just want the information, they want you to give them that information. So if they're reading it, they don't, they don't want a list of facts. This isn't Wikipedia. They want you to speak to them and nobody else. So, so honor that. Once again, find opportunities. Websites uh, and article and magazines accept freelance submissions all the time. Just look up the editor of the online outlet or the magazine, pitch them an idea, write us a couple sentences and say, what do you think of this? Can I write 500 words about this? And they'll say yes or no. And that's it. And you'll move on and you'll find out pretty quick. There's also a lot of blogging platforms like The Conversation, like Medium, like Forbes. You can even blog on your own website. You can even blog on Facebook and social media. There are a bunch of opportunities out there to express your own voice if you want it to. And, and you can just get to write. 
You just get to do your own thing. In terms of targets, I don't mean this literally in terms of actually writing for, say, a 10-year-old child. I mean, watch your use of jargon. Watch your use of, of academies of the way you would write in a journal article because that is the primary way you're used to writing articles. Just back off and be aware that this is not an audience of your colleagues. This is not an audience of experts. This is an audience of people who are interested and that's it. You have no idea what their background or level of technical knowledge might be. So when in doubt, explain something. That's what I mean by that, by right for a kid. When in doubt, explain. And uh, I've, it's, it's very easy in articles, especially writing. To, to not really have a point. When you go to write your article, have an idea right there. Like there's a reason you're writing your article. Like I want to explain this, or I want to counteract this, or I want to show the relationship between these. If that's your point, get there. Everything you write, must serve that one goal of actually getting to the point and showcasing that point. And so that when the reader walks away, they walk away with that point. So get there, get there. Don't distract yourself. If you find yourself going in a different direction, uh, copy and paste that uh, somewhere else. Make that its own article, make that its own thing. Don't be afraid. I see almost as much if not more nervousness surrounding writing as I do public events. Public events that has that, has that, that fear factor of a bunch of people staring at you with wait, bated breath. Articles, I think it's this sense of permanence. Like once you write it and it's out there in the wild, it exists and you can't get rid of it. You can edit it, you can change it, but it's already been archived on a million servers and it's out there and our descendants 5,000 years from now will be able to read it if they want to. So there's this fear of like, oh, if I put it out there, it will stick. What if I do something wrong? What if I say something incorrectly? What if people come away with the wrong impression? We'll just do it. Just do it. You might say something wrong. I've written wrong stuff. I've made entire videos that turned out to be wrong and I've had to yank them down and make videos again saying, wow, I, I really screwed that up, didn't I? And now this is what I should say. It just happens. No one expects you to be perfect. So why should you expect yourself to be perfect? Nothing you've ever read on the internet has ever been perfect anyway. So why should it start with you? Uh, and it, don't assume you have to find the audience. One of the beautiful things about publishing online, especially through venues like The Conversation or, uh, or pitching an idea to an editor, is there's already an audience there. There are already people who are searching for that content. And as soon as you write it, it will start showing up in their searches. Once again, reiterating this point, don't write a journal article. This is not an article for your colleagues, so don't even bother. And here we are again. <laughs> yes, this one's going to be in every single one too. Don't sacrifice your research. Don't feel like you have to be one of these bloggers that, that puts out something every single day or every single week. If the muse strikes you once every three months to come up with an article idea and pitch it or post it somewhere, then do it every few months. There's no pressure. There's so much content out there. You're not necessarily trying to make a living off of this. You're just trying to communicate something to a certain audience. So do it when it feels right. Because if you feel pressured to do it, you're, you're not going to come off authentic. So that's it for articles. And let's jump back to the Q&A. If any of you have any questions about writing articles, Meanwhile, I'll catch my breath. This is a great audience. You guys are asking fantastic questions, by the way. I really appreciate it. Lots of questions coming through. And once again, thank you, Jamie, for sending them to me. Uh, if, if no questions, 
And I see the, uh, the chat is very active in answering some other uh, questions. Uh, that's great. Feel free to chat. I can't hear you, so it doesn't distract me. Uh, but if there are no questions there, I will, don't worry. If you come up with a question about writing articles, what to do, how to do it, I'm more than happy to come back to it at the end. In the meantime, let's go back. All right, everyone's favorite or least favorite uh, social media. Now, I know that in this Cavalier webinar series, uh, our Cavalier Alda seminar series, there is going to be a whole webinar just about social media. So I'm not going to hit this too hard, but I do want to talk about social media in general. And in general, Act natural. Once again, this is a way for you to express yourself. This is a way for you to express your research. This is a way for you to express your opinions. This is a way for you to express your views. This is a way for you to express your perspective, yours and yours alone. If you're not being yourself, then who exactly are you being and why should anyone care about that? They want the science from you, no one else. They want it from you. So on social media, allow yourself to come out, allow your own personality to come out in social media and find opportunities. There are so many social media platforms and there will be about a billion social media platforms in the future Look for it, look for it. And again, you don't have to sacrifice research. You don't have to make social media a full-time job. You don't have to become an influencer to make this work. Post when you feel like posting, share when you feel like sharing, and that's it. But look for those opportunities. You heard of a new social media platform like uh, TikTok. TikTok's a thing now. What the heck is TikTok? We'll, we'll find out and see if you can contribute your own perspective, your own research in the world of TikTok. Maybe, maybe not. If you're interested in growing a social me media presence, start small. Just start speaking, just start talking, just start posting, just start sharing uh, pictures or, or little texts or, or longer, longer articles, reshare, just, just start small. Don't try to make this a full-time job because like it, it doesn't make any money and you already have a full-time job. So just start small. Don't worry about volume, all right? You're not in the game for volume, you're in it for quality. And because there are so many social media platforms, find something that fits. If your research, if your work naturally involves a lot of cool pictures, well then go on Instagram and start sharing a bunch of cool pictures. If you want to participate in a lot of dialogues and back and forth, some little snippets, well then just go over onto Twitter. If you want some more long form content, if you want to post some videos, then go on Facebook or YouTube. You don't have to be on all social media platforms and all social media platforms have their individual strengths and weaknesses. So feel free to just dig into one of them and really enjoy it. And whatever best matches your own personality and whatever best matches what you're trying to communicate, that will be the platform for you. And something that I've especially found on Twitter when it comes to social media is that there is a difference between in-reach and outreach. And there's no right answer. I see a lot of communities have collected together on Twitter and also on Facebook groups, but that's more closed off. Twitter is accessible and open to the public, these conversations, where it's a bunch of academics talking to each other about academic stuff which is fine and good and fascinating. And a lot of people follow those conversations, even though the conversations aren't meant for the public, the public still can consumes it and still gets something out of it. That's different, I see, from 
messages and posts on Twitter that are meant for a broader audience. So decide, especially if you're on Twitter, are you going to talk to fellow, your colleagues and allow people to witness that conversation? Or are you going to talk to the general public? Or are you going to do both? Some people do both. Don't invest a lot of time in this. I can't, I can't say this enough and I will say it again. You don't need to sink hours upon hours into social media. A little tweet here, a cool picture there, spend 10 minutes cleaning it up and adding a caption, post on Instagram, boom, you're done. Uh, put your phone down for a day or three days or three weeks and then post again. You don't have to invest a lot of time. You don't have to make this a full-time job. And like I said earlier, don't try to be everywhere. You can try to post to Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and TikTok and something else and, and YouTube comments and everything that can get exhausting very, very quickly. All right. A lot of the people that do that are professionals who have hired someone to do them for them. So pick something that fits. If you end up fitting everywhere and being able to blast out posts left and right and it doesn't eat up a lot of your time, then do that. More power to you. But find something that fits and focus on that. And one of the coolest things about social media, like, like with writing articles, is don't try to find an audience. The audience will find you. Add some hashtags, link to some interesting people that you like, follow them, respond to them. The audience that is interested in your topic will naturally over time find you and start to follow you and start to engage with you. That is the magic of social media is you just have to be yourself, speak as yourself and your audience will find you. And once again, here, here it is, I promised, don't sacrifice research. You don't have to give up your work if you don't want to. If you want to, if you want to become a social media maven and an influencer, uh, more power to you, my hat's off to you. That's awesome, good for you. If you don't, don't feel like you're compelled to be on these platforms 24 seven, to flood these forums and Twitter feeds with messages. Let it fit naturally into the rhythm of your work so that when you're busy, don't sweat it. And when you're not busy and you wanna post, go ahead and post and don't, doesn't have to feel like it's taken away from your research. All right, looks like we got some more questions. Coming over on social media. Uh, my business colleagues, many of whom are libertarian, have a very difficult time accepting, understanding, or even considering the latest social science data that indicates, for example, that raising the minimum wage lowers the suicide rate. Uh, and so it pits their values against their intellect. How do you deal with this uh, sign going crazy in Arizona? Yeah. Uh, how do you convince people? You don't. Stop trying. Stop trying. They're trying, from their perspective, from their perspective, they've been trying to convince you for all these years, and they're getting nowhere, and they're the ones going crazy in Arizona. You disagree with these people. You believe you're correct because of the weight of evidence, uh, data collection, statistics. That's fantastic. They believe they are correct for different reasons. Your value, the way you measure correctness is fundamentally different. How the heck are you supposed to ever agree? You can get into arguments with them. You can get into debates with them if you want. You, the goal, however, isn't to convince them the goal is to understand what, is, what their real concerns are. The goal is to, in any good debate, in any good argument, it isn't trying to win someone over, but it's trying to understand what they're really after. What are they really caring about? What are their, what are their real principles? Maybe there's something there that you didn't realize or they didn't realize. So long ago, I gave up trying, and this is my personal, my personal tactic. Other people have ta different tactics. I gave up trying to convince people. 
Instead, I go on these platforms, I go on events, I write books, et cetera, et cetera, to just share what I know and how I know it. That's it. That's it. Another question, how do you select an optimal social media platform? For example, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, podcast, while you're thinking about sharing your scientific perspective. This is one of those things of picking an optimal platform only comes from trial and error. Look at your own personality, look at your own research and the content and style and pace of your research. Give Twitter a try for six months. Say, I'm gonna go all in on Twitter for six months. I'm just gonna tweet, I'm gonna share, see what kind of audience gathers around it. Do you like it? Yes, no, maybe. Okay, put it down for a while. Go to Instagram, give that six months. Post, like, repost, comment on other people's stuff that you like. Do you like the audience there? Do you like the community that you're, that you're growing there? Follow some of the hashtags. Do you like, are you enjoying being a consumer in that environment? If yes, then that might be the right fit. So just trial and error and patience. Uh, we got to keep moving. Uh, I see more questions about social media. We will come back to it at the end after I share my screen again. And we're moving over to books. Oh my gosh. So uh, I've, I've written uh, two books. My second book is coming out next month. So it's not like I'm the world's most uh, prolific author, but I have picked up a few do's and don'ts when it comes to uh, the opportunity to write books and how to craft a book for the general public. Number one, you guessed it, act natural, especially in a book. A book is 100,000 words. It should be 100,000 of your words, of how you speak. There is no set standard for how a nonfiction book should appear. I have a very casual style. I have a very conversational uh, writing style. It took a while for my first book to sell or to get a publisher. And some publishers said, no, we don't like this style. But then some publishers said, we really love this style. So just be yourself. And it will be less exhausting. If you're trying to be something you're not, you are going to drive yourself into the dirt before that book is done. And again, find opportunities. There are many ways to publish a book nowadays. There are, there are the traditional path, of getting a publisher to print your book. And then there are non-traditional paths of self-publishing on Amazon or just posting it on your website and, or, or posting it on a Reddit forum or something. Like there have been successful books written and published to, to Reddit, for example. Don't be afraid to just get it. If you just want it out there, this idea, this concept out there, don't be afraid to push it out. If you are interested in the traditional publishing route, you need to have an agent. Publishers just, by and large, this is not 100%, but like 98%, will not work with a random author. If you pitch them ideas, they will just immediately put it in the trash because they don't have time for it. So the number, your number one job is to get in a literary agent. Your literary agent will be the one who sells the book for you. And to get a literary agent, you look up online, literary agents who are accepting pitches. That's it. And then you find one or a list of them that are accepting pitches in your field of what you want to write about. And you send them a pitch, which is a title and one paragraph. And if they like it, if they like it, they'll ask you for more information. And when it comes to the world of nonfiction, they're going to ask you for something called a proposal. The proposal is a list of chapters, uh, one or two sam sample chapters, description of the book, and then also your marketing platform. What is your social media presence? Uh, how often are you in the news? What are your media contacts? How are you going to help sell this book? If the, if the, agent likes the proposal, they will sign you as one of their clients, and then they will turn around and try to sell that book to a publisher. 
also have a new idea. If you're interested in writing a book and exploring a topic, go to a bookstore, go to Amazon, see what books are currently being written. Maybe there's a niche here that no one's ever thought of before. Maybe there is a topic that you know, you're willing to revisit again. Uh, my first book, Your Place in the Universe, it's about cosmology. It's about the history of the universe. Do you know how many books have been written about the history of the universe? A lot. The vast majority of the content of my book is not new. What is new is my presentation of it. What is new is my angle of it on it and my way of presenting it. But the topic itself is not new. So you, what you have to figure out is what is going to be new about what you present? What's going to be different? Be prepared for it to take forever. However, once you get an agent, if an agent finds, likes your book, they'll start pitching it. You might get a book deal in three months. You might get a book deal in three years. You just never know. It depends on so many things outside of your control. An editor at a publishing house may just love your book, but man, they just published a book on a similar topic a year ago, and so they need to wait a few years before they publish something in that, in that vein again. Your, you may need more time for your popularity to grow before a publisher will be interested in you. Just be prepared. It might be fast, but it might be years. It took a year and a half for me to get my first book published after I got an agent. But don't write the book. If you are going with the traditional publication model, publishers don't want the whole book. In fiction, they do. If you're writing a fiction book, you have to write the whole thing. But nonfiction, they want the proposal. Once you're signed, then you're, you'll be given a certain amount of time, like six months to a year, to actually write the book. And don't worry about selling it yet. Your publisher has a publicist. Your publisher has marketing arms. Your publisher is interested in selling this book and they will work to sell the book. You're going to be a part of that, but your publisher and your agent will guide you through that. Um, don't, get, don't get hung up on a title. I get so many people, I, I encounter a lot of people that have an idea for a book. And the idea for the book starts and ends with their title. My title for my first book changed three times before it went to print. And the print book, the print, the one that's out there is not the title that I came up with years ago. And same for my next book. That changed uh, twice. That changed twice. Don't get hung up on the title because it's not probably not going to be the title that you're going to publish with. And don't sacrifice research. Writing a book is a big endeavor. It really is. It is a major time sink. I won't, I won't lie about that. But you're given a window of time, six months to a year to write 100,000 words. That's, that's a lot of work, but not a soul-crushing amount of work. If you are going to invest in writing a book, you can fit this in with your scientific research without. It, it requires some juggling and it may require some late nights. It is an investment because it is a lot of effort, but it's over. There is a deadline to it. So going back to the Q and A, uh, how? In yes, this this is a, a great. Uh, this isn't a question, but this is a great comment. You can find the names of agents who may be interested in your topic by reading the dedications and similar books. So you open up a book, look at the dedication. You know, I'd like to thank my agent. Email that agent. They may not accept you because uh, they already have a an author in that space for you, but they might recommend you. If they think you have a good idea, they'll recommend you to, to someone else. How long did it take you to write your books? Uh, my, each one took, I would say total uh, about nine months from beginning of uh, first germination of idea to final copy edit. You know, is two months here, then a break of like a year, and then writing of six months, and then a break of a month, and then a month of editing, all together about nine months. What is a way to grow your popularity before your book gets published? Slowly. Being present on social media. 
doing media interviews, getting a network of reporters who like you and trust you, uh, doing a podcast, which I'll talk about next, writing, regularly writing articles for some online outlet or in-print outlet. The more you do that over time, one, you'll gain the skills you need to write a book, and two, you'll steadily grow your popularity to the level that a publisher will be interested in you. And what about creating an ebook? Yes, you can self-publish. I don't have as much familiarity with that because I did go with the traditional publishing model for my books. It's basically the same thing, except you don't go through an agent, you don't go through an editor, you just put it on Amazon, but then 100% of the marketing is up to you. So really, self-publishing means self-marketing. And marketing itself is a major time sink. You might invest more time in marketing to actually get the book out there than you do actually writing the book. But it's a viable path for a lot of people, so I won't. I won't knock it. All right, last section. Podcasts and videos. So I've been hosting a podcast for the past five years called Ask a Spaceman. I also have a live radio show. I also do a bunch of YouTube videos. I do YouTube video uh, about twice a week. And there is a massive world out here in podcasting and video, and, and the, but they share some, uh, some similarities. Number one, act natural. When you're in front of a camera, when you're in front of a microphone, just be yourself. You want your voice. If you think like, ooh, I don't have a radio voice or I don't have a face for, for videos, forget it, forget it. Just talk into the microphone like you would normally talk. Let your enthusiasm shine. Let your curiosity shine. Let it come out. You will be rewarded. Because people don't want a robot reading a Wikipedia article. They want you to talk about it. They want your voice. They want personality. So get that personality out there and find opportunities. If you're not interested in starting your own podcast or YouTube series, Find a bunch of creators that you like, some podcasters or video publishers. Email them. Ask if you can be a guest. Ask if you can get an interview. Ask if you can help with editing or writing. You don't have to go all the way to self-production and actually putting stuff out there to be a part of the podcasting and videos, uh, YouTube space. Uh, there are quite a few people that serve as correspondents for say a weekly YouTube video show. And that's a totally cool model. There are so many barriers to YouTubing, to podcasting, live streaming, going on Twitch, all that. Just get started. The only way you're going to get better at this or good at this is to just do it. You will learn slowly over time. You will make a video and you will watch that video and you'll say, wow, now I know never to do that again. Or you'll make a recording and you'll listen to the recording and say, wow, I had no idea my lips made that kind of noise. I'll make sure to make my lips not do that anymore. Or man, I, I do a lot of mm's and ahs and uhs when I talk. I have to train myself to stop using those. But the only way you'll learn that is by actually doing it and listening to yourself. And while you're doing it, you might as well publish. You might as well put it out there in the world. Why not? You're creating content. Speaking of content, you just have to produce, produce, produce. You just have to make it. You just have to keep publishing. You just have to keep making it. If you're gonna make a video, you can do one video, put it on YouTube and walk away. That, that's fine. That video will get like 10 views and that's it. If you want to be a presence, if you want to try to grow an audience, you have to put something out, prefer, preferably on a regular schedule because audiences like to know what they're gonna get and when they're gonna get it. They like to know, okay, it's Wednesday at four o'clock. Here comes my favorite YouTube video. I can watch it tonight before I fall asleep. Or it's Saturday morning, podcasts come out just in time for my Saturday morning run. This is, 
think of how you consume media. Think of how you do it. This is what your audience is going to want. And we're, we're all amateurs when it comes to podcasting and YouTube videos. Do your best to make it good. If you're making a video, get a decent camera. You know, spend, if you want to spend some money, spend like 500 bucks on a decent camera. Spend 100 bucks on a lighting rig. Look at different locations in your house or your office. Look at the lighting. Play it back to yourself. Does it look decent? It doesn't look, have, have to look amazing. It doesn't have to look amazing, but it can't look so bad that it's off-putting. And if you're going to record, spend a little bit of money on a microphone. This microphone, the, the Yeti Blue, was like 90 bucks. 90 bucks. And now they're making, this was years ago, so now they're making like $50 microphones that are really good. Find a place that sounds good to record. Closets, if you have a walk-in closet, congratulations, you have a, an in-home recording studio. I'm not joking. Play around with different places and then listen back to it. It doesn't have to be, have the greatest sound production or sound quality, but if it sounds so bad that it's off-pitting, then you will put off your audiences. They will turn it on and say, this sounds gross, and they will turn it off and stop listening. So at least make it good. It doesn't have to be amazing. Like I said, you don't have to have super high production values. You don't need to blow $1,000 on a green screen and a giant camera and special effects and animations. You don't have to do that. Podcasting is way cheaper than videos. So if you want to start publishing something in this realm, I suggest podcasting is a good place to start because it's, it's a microphone in you alone in your closet. Uh, don't assume you'll get any money for this whatsoever. YouTube ads pay around a penny per 100 views, you know, plus or minus, all right? That's basically nothing. Podcast, you, you probably listen to a bunch of podcasts that have sponsors and sponsorships. Usually sponsors aren't interested unless you're getting around 20,000 downloads per month, which is pretty large. So when you do this, if you go into this, don't assume that you're going to be financially compensated for it. You're going to do this because it's fun and you want to share science, share your research with an audience. Don't ignore your personality, act natural, let it shine. And don't worry about the size of the audience. If you've been publishing for a few months and 100 people are downloading your podcast every week, that's 100 people that are listening to your research in your work and your perspectives that weren't listening to it before. That is powerful. That is powerful. Imagine giving a weekly lecture series, public lecture, where a hundred people regularly show up week after week. That'd be pretty major, that'd be pretty major. So don't worry about getting giant numbers. Don't compare yourself against these giant channels or or high production value podcasts that have huge audiences and are pulling sponsors, you know, they're playing a different game than you are. They're playing a different game. So you don't have to compare yourself to them. Look at the audience that you have and connect with that audience as they are. That is the end of my presentation. As promised, there's plenty of time at the end we do have a question right away. Does uh, writing for kids approach apply for audio and video production? Definitely like the approach of when in doubt, explain and get to the point. Yes, yes, yes. Largely, almost any of my do's and don'ts apply to any one of these uh, topics. If you have a video, if you want to make a 10 minute YouTube video, decide what that topic is going to be. Get to that point. Present that topic. Maybe you get there in three minutes. Maybe it takes you eight. It'll take the amount of time it needs to get to the point. And be aware of what you have to explain to get to your point. So if you have some topic up here that you really want to explain, and you're going to bring the audience there, uh, but in the middle, there's some, there's a very critical piece, some jargon term. Go ahead, let spend some time there. Let your audience absorb that because you know you're on your way to a larger goal. So 
make sure you're always serving the point and you don't get distracted. Don't let that little jargon term or technical point be the topic of the video. Let it serve that larger point. But it's the exact same thing for podcasts or videos. In terms of length of podcasts, I've seen podcasts that are one minute long and they publish them every single day. And it's like, you, you, you get your little one minute bit of science and you move on to something else. That's great. I've seen podcasts that are like 12 hours long. They're basically audio books. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, those are great. Those are like, those are for the long haul cross country drives. There's room for everything. Trust me, both in videos and in audio. General Q&A. Can you share some suggestions on engaging with audiences that are not already comfortable engaging with your science? Oh. Like people attending a science event. Guess what? If they've shown up, they are ready to engage. The people who are not truly ready to engage are at home. They're not there. If they are in front of you and their eyes are locked with yours, they are ready. So what do you do? You meet them. You meet them exactly where they are. You ask them, what are you curious about tonight? Why did you come out? Did you hope to learn something? <clears throat> Maybe they'll have an answer. Maybe they'll just say, I, in general, I just want to have my mind blown. Well, then blow their mind. Uh, I just want to see something cool. Well, then show them something cool. If they say, I really wanted to meet a scientist, well, then shake their hand. They are right there. They are right there. They are ready to engage because they showed up. Uh, question, uh, going back to talking to reporters, how do you ask about on the record? I assume that every single thing I say to a reporter from the moment I pick up the phone is on the record. And usually they'll say, I'm recording this conversation because I can't write notes fast enough. Everything you say. So if you're, so be wary of that. If you're saying like, yeah, wow, that, that researcher, what a jerk, huh? And then ha ha ha, like, Mm, you might see like, quote, that researcher Zidger said, you. Assume it's always on the record. If you really need to explain something off the record, tell the reporter, say, I want to explain something. There's some background information that I pr prefer not be in an article, not be presented to the public, but I, I need to tell this to you so that you have more context for the story you're trying to write. They may or may not be comfortable with it. Usually reporters will honor that, but you can't get a guarantee about that. So just assume everything you say is going to be on the record. How can you find out what an audience already knows about a topic? This is a tough one, especially in live presentations. Excuse me. Uh, this is a tough one. What I try to do is bell curve it. I assume that an audience, if they're say 20 something, then they, I'm gonna assume they have some, some college experience. If they're 40 something, I'm gonna assume they have college plus life experience. If they're 10, I'm gonna assume they've gone to kindergarten. So I'll ballpark an educational level and I will speak to that educational level. Some things I will explain really heavily. Some things I will assume the audience knows. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get it wrong because 100 different people in that room will have 100 different experiences. Some of the content that you present will be rudimentary for some of your audience. Some of it will go over their heads. But what I hope to construct in a talk is that there's something for everyone that someone who is coming in with that average level of education, that they can come in, maybe they're not familiar with this topic at all, but maybe they're just, their minds are blown by black holes and that's good enough for them. But then maybe there's someone that's asking about a really technical topic or curious about a technical topic, put a little nuggets in there. Don't be afraid of the jargon. Don't be afraid of the jargon as long as you explain it well. In the end, you just guess. In the end, you just guess and feel free. This is, again, why I like to ask a lot of questions or allow the audience to ask a lot of questions because then they start to guide the discussion. I don't have to guess anymore. Tips to uh, talking to middle and high school public 
teachers. Uh, I'm going to assume this is in terms of getting them engaged, getting them interested, getting them uh, to invite you to come talk to their classrooms, or if sometimes there can be uh, teacher workshops and Sorry about that, I have a little bit of a cough. Uh, when I speak to teachers, of course I don't patronize them, but I, I speak at the level of their grade. So if they're a high school teacher, I will present to them as if I were presenting to high schoolers because that's the level that they're trying to connect. That's what they're trying to give to their students. So that's where they wanna be. Oh, oh, how about panels or Q&As, focal points as a guest? I've, I have done a few panels. A Comic cons are so much fun. If you haven't done a panel at a Comic Con or pitched a panel, get a view and a few of your friends. And then whatever your research topic is, say the research topic of superheroes, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. And you will get an awesome audience asking tons of questions and it's hilarious. Uh, if you're in a panel, let the person, the host of the panel, again, guide the discussion. They will give you questions. They will funnel questions. It's their job to be, to be the mediator between the panel and the audience. Pay attention to them. If they're signaling that, hey, you've been droning on for too long, then, then just shut up and move on. If they, they might have a follow-up question, but let that host guide you. That is their job. Another question, um, when there's a wide variety of education levels in your audience, how do you tailor the content of your talk? It's exactly that, that kind of bell curve mentality of I know this isn't going to hit every single person equally, so I'm trying to put something in there for everyone. That's the best you can do. That's really the best you can do. How do you avoid or prevent blackouts? Personally, I'm scared of this happening, so I tend to read off the slides, which makes my presentation very boring. Very, very good question. You have to train this out of you. You have to discipline it out of you. So the next time you're gonna give a talk or a presentation, make, challenge yourself with to put as few words as possible in there. Maybe just bullet points, maybe no words at all. Then give the talk to an empty room. Give the talk to an empty room. It could be your living room. It could be your cat. It could be your family. It doesn't matter. Give the talk. And if you stumble, if you forget, then you know, okay, here is a point where I forgot my presentation. Here is a point where I stumbled. Then in your slide, add a little cue, add a little signifier, add something to help you along in that spot. Maybe it's a new, uh, a new bullet point that appears when you click. So that when you're in that spot again, you have a brief visual reminder and you can keep going again, but you have to train it out of you. Uh, when you try to crack a joke, what's a good way of sending the audience a signal that, that that was a joke? You can do what I do, which is laugh at my own jokes or like waggle your eyebrows. Sometimes like when I gave, when, when my last book came out, I went on tour and I gave somewhere around 50 talks. And it was the exact same talk in every single city in the United States. I mean, I changed very, very little because I wanted to nail this talk. I had jokes in the talk, same jokes every single time. Some audiences, some cities would just light up at the jokes and some would be like, at the end, humor is so subjective. You just move on. You just move on. But try, you know, be your geeky, nerdy self. Tell some jokes. How do you prepare for an interview if you've never done it before? Be uh, your own smart self. You are already a subject matter expert. You already know way more than the reporter does. So when the reporter, so, so you don't necessarily need to prepare. It, it, it prepare. If the reporter is asking about a very specific topic or press release, then read the press release, read the paper, make sure you, you at least understand the general context, and then let the reporter ask you questions. They will ask you questions, you will answer them. If you don't know the answer, 
you don't know the answer. If you stumble and fumble for a little bit, the reporter will give you time and the reporter will, will pull out what they need to pull out. How do you find a good publication for articles that might have an interest in audience, for example? Uh, start, if, if you have an idea for a topic that you wanna write about, search that topic, search some of the keywords, look for where similar articles are already published, look for those websites. If you can find a website, then you dig into their archives and say, wow, a lot of these articles are along in the same kind of field that I'm interested in presenting. Well, then go there, well, then go there. Is there a balance between in-reach and outreach? Does changing your energy work in these spaces? Everyone has a different balance. Some are all in on in-reach, some are all in on outreach, some are a little bit both. Some have a slightly different voice for outreach and a slightly different voice for in-reach. The only way to do it is to, to do it yourself and you will find, listen to yourself. If you're really enjoying in-reach and talking to your colleagues on social media, well then do more of that because it makes you feel good. And if it feels really good to talk to the public and present stuff and you don't really care about this shouting match happening in your field, well then do that. Listen to yourself and be open to shifting and changing your mind. Uh, hi Paul, I'm a science editor. I'm just thinking about my take home message from your webinar today. It looks like it is to help the author maintain their authentic voice. Uh, that is correct. This is, uh, given you have most likely worked with science editors in your career, especially in production of your books, is there a secondary take home message you have for the science editors out there? If you are a science editor, if you're someone, uh, please, please don't shout down. Don't, don't shut down any voices. I get it. Some publications have a specific voice. I have pitched articles to certain publications and they've said, no, we're not interested because your style doesn't fit our style. I think that is ultimately detrimental. I think a variety of voices is beneficial. I think a variety of writing styles and approaches. You can have the exact same topic presented five different ways. There will be at least five different people who will get something out of those different voices that they couldn't get from the other voices. So just, just be open. I think we're almost out of time. So maybe just one more question. Should you keep the length of your podcast stick? standard or can I produce a one minute one day and a one hour another day? I would suggest keeping your podcast in roughly the same ballpark. All of my podcasts are between 25 and 45-ish minutes. This is part of the audience expectations. If they get used to one minute podcasts and then boom, there's an hour long podcast, they're not going to know how to fit that into their routine and they're likely to not listen to it. And if you're doing a bunch of one hour and then you do a one minute, they're going to be like, wait a minute, there's something, something wrong with my, what's going on? So it's about making sure the audience, you got to train your audience. You got to create that, that rhythm, that pattern so that you can be dependable. Uh, thank you so much to everyone who showed up today. I believe this is going to be archived, which is going to be uh, fantastic. Thank you so much to the All in All This Center, uh, the Cavalier Foundation for, for hosting this. You guys had so many fantastic questions. Uh, you can find me on social media. I'm at Paul Matt Sutter, P-A-U-M-A-T-T-S-U-T-T-E-R. You can also go to my website, pmsutter.com. It has links to my books and podcasts and YouTube videos and all that. And um, if you have any more questions offline, feel free to go to my website and send me an email. I'll be happy to keep answering your questions after. Thank you again. Thank you so much for sharing all your insights and strategies with us. I really loved what you said about your audience finding you on social media and all the tips about getting a book published was really intriguing as well. Um, to finish up, we have a quick two question poll for you all um, and we'd love your feedback. And finally, we'd like to thank the Cavley Foundation for their generous support. Um, it's what makes it possible for the Alda Center to offer webinars such as these. Stay tuned for the poll, which should pop up right on your screen. Thanks again.